but we're going to talk about communication in the ED. And I want to suggest something to you. I believe that this is one of the most central aspects of our practice. That this, whether your communication system and strategy is good or bad, can greatly influence patient safety, quality, your practice life when you go to work. And let's see if I can make that case to you and suggest to you ways that we might improve it. Um, is Dixon Chung in the audience? Dixon, are you here? Well, you're gonna meet him. Oh, there he is in the very back. Uh, we just actually got the contents of this paper, which we wrote with two communications experts, accepted for publication in the Joint Commission Journal. So it'll be coming out in uh, May this year. So half of Sentinel events be occur because there's trouble with communication. Is that sound still good? Just trying to move it, okay. 84% of Sentinel events are, go back to a root cause of some sort of communication. Think about the plane that went down. What if the guy on the ground had said, guys, where's your altitude? Remember he just said, how's it going up there? Very vague question. Had he queried, what's your altitude? Maybe that could have been prevented, but it just sh shows you how loosey-goosey we can be with communications in the ER. And one of the biggest problems we fight is the, the ambient noise level that we, that we work in every day and don't think much about. So here's our journey today. The negative effects of noise on patients and on ourselves. Uh, modes of communicating, and I'm gonna sort of make you understand what the communication people already understand. Methods and affordances. These will be common terms to you by the end of this short little talk. Then how would you measure if, if you actually made things better? And then what would be a general communication strategy for your department? So this is really bad news and I don't know how to break it to you, but in terms of your ability to hear as you get older, you should have been a rock star because that's how much, how hard our jobs are in the ER. The ambient noise is so great that it takes a toll and we have the same rate of going deaf as rock stars. I keep thinking of some of our ED le leaders in a rock group, you know, like Dave Seberg, we call it the Prez. The Prez, we could get some of those guys up there at a rock band. Uh, here's some of the, the, the worst sources of noise, by the way, in your ER. It's just staff voices, and what do you do in the ER when you're trying to yell to Judy that, that you want to give uh, some epi in room two to the allergic reaction? What do you do when it's loud? You yell louder, right? And we all do this, and you can watch an ED escalate. In fact, it will often start at the low times of the day as not particularly noisy, and you can just watch the decibels go up during the day. But some of our medical equipment is really bad. That your good friendly ice machine makes a lot of noise. World Health Organization says we should be at 40 decibels most of the time, and we live and breathe at 70, 75, sometimes 90. All of these things make noise. Um, Thank goodness people are paying attention. And did you know, if you're anybody here doing a remodel, rebuild, revamp of their ER, anybody doing anything or thinking about it? There are now uh, building supplies, in particular wallpapers, t ceiling tiles, flooring, and so forth, that help absorb sound. So it's something to just think about. So I threw that in there. But your handy dandy tube system, how many people have a tube system? I should see every hand go up by now. Tube system in the ER. It's the same amount of assault on your eardrums as a truck going by on the highway at 60 miles an hour. And it's going on all day. So from a patient standpoint, I thought this stuff is just fascinating. So if you have high ambient noise, blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up, they don't sleep well, newborn babies need more oxygen when it's noisy in their unit, how about that? I thought that was very compelling. And then this ought to get the C-suite's attention and yours as well. Coronary units with high noise levels had higher readmission rates. Remember, readmissions are going to get us into trouble, at least you know, in the near future with the way the law is written and they're going to be enforced. So all these things show that patients' health suffers. What about, uh, uh, what about uh, ED patients in particular? It's a very stressful place, and I just saw this study. It had just come out this, uh, in, from the Medical Journal of Australia uh, back in 2011. They took patients who were in the ER and they asked them to volunteer for a study. And while they were there, they gave them different noises, noise to listen to and monitored their stress and monitored their vital signs. The worst was the ED noise itself. Anything was better. Even a drum beat was better and more soothing to the patients than what we listened to day in and day out in our ERs. And it's a, a big patient dissatisfier. 
You know, they've asked at restaurants, the Zagat restaurant surveys have asked about noise for a long time. And now we're, we're paying particular attention because both press gating and age caps have questions focused on the noise level that patients are experiencing. High ambient noise with us. So you, you're going to work. As it starts to get noisier, your blood pressure is going up. You have higher rates of coronary artery disease if you work in a very noisy place. Noise in ICU actually was a predictor of nurse burnout. So they were comparing different ICUs. And the higher noise level ICUs had more turnover in nurses and burnout. And then, as we said, there's uh, so many studies out there now that show that if you work in a hospital, you have a higher rate of deafness uh, as the years go by. Uh, and and uh, anybody noticing it, maybe you don't want to say. I actually am supposed to wear a hearing aid, but I don't always wear it. You, you know when you notice it is in the exact environment that you work in, because when there's a lot of background noise is when people who start to lose their hearing notice it the most, right? They may not notice it so much one-on-one. -on -one. All right, so communication effectiveness. What, what makes communication more effective? Well, to be sure, if we're closer, but we aren't in the ER, are we? Are we? We're not always that way. Dr. Welch, I'm going to give more morphine in room two. Right? Is this how communication goes in your ER? We're very casual about it, and we shout it. Uh, so when there's high ambient noise, which we said the ER is like that, when people are multitasking, okay, and also when there's a choice of interrupting, and I want to suggest to you, I think that we are very bizarre in this regard in terms of ER culture. And I'll, and I'll give you a little scenario to demonstrate it. I'm working, it's 3 in the morning, I'm feeling that 3 a.m lag, going to go to the, the vending machines and get some coffee and get a little candy bar. And I'm trying to decide M&Ms or, you know, Snickers. The nurses come with me and she's chatting to me about a patient in a very difficult family. When I go to push that button, she stops, right? It's kind of like etiquette, isn't it? Like you let the person have some sort of space and quiet to, to make a decision to do a task. We do this at restaurants when somebody's looking at a menu. You stop talking, let them look at the menu and so forth. Um, so five, 10 minutes later, we've got a critical patient. A resident and I have just gotten in a very difficult central line. Line Same nurse comes over with a piece of paper with a blood gas on it, shoves it in my face, says, Dr. Welch, here's the blood gas. The resident and I both jumped back and lost our central line. And I just thought to myself, we, we really do not have any interruption etiquette and any, men, any etiquette when we're practicing the ER, you do it too. Don't you? Your nurse is mixing a medication. You're like, Jill, Jill, this patient's ready to go. Don't we all do it? And, I thought, and I, it's a peculiarity of our specialty, and I don't, I'm not sure I understand why. We are so willing. I mean, do we just think that we're so fabulous at multitasking that we can do all these things at once? Because evidence would suggest otherwise. We can't, we can't do it all at once. But so I want you to think about your work days and how they go. We, we are mad about interrupting one another and breaking into each other's concentration and space. I, I really believe that. And it's a, something to do with ED etiquette. Maybe we should write a paper on that, ED etiquette. Uh, so, very interesting, 80% of what you do, you might think that you're doing uh, patient care, actually what you probably think is that you're documenting, but 80% of the time is spent communicating. And so, it's a very uh, big and important part of the work that we do in the ER. And oh, by the way, that was from uh, Chisholm's studies. You probably see he's done all the studies about how many times we're interrupted, like 10 times an hour as an ER doc. Uh, there's different ways that we can make uh, mistakes in the ER. We can make it b by an omission. We can make it because we're ambiguous, like the, the, the ground to the pilot, you know, what's going on up there? Ambiguous communication. Or what we're more and more seeing is overload. Are you reading now about uh, monitor fatigue? There's so many monitors going off in the ER, you stop listening to it. Watch yourself. I was at a bedside the other night, and I'm totally talking through the, the pulse ox alarm that's going off the whole time. Uh, you, you glance up once, you see, oh, it's not measuring right. And you ignore it, and you're talking, and the patients are very distressed, right? Aren't they? There's an alarm going off, you know, or an IV beeping, right? We are just overloaded from an auditory standpoint, so we literally stop. Uh, we're on overload. We stop paying attention to it. Here's where communication errors are at their worst, and so they should be a particular focus for us. When at triage, and particularly getting the important information from the get-go, testing test results, getting those pushed to a provider in a timely manner without error, handoffs, and that's why there's been a big focus on that, and then right at admission when they're literally changing changing in their physical space, geographic space. These are these are points of uh, you know possible terrorism due to lack of communication. Um, 
how well can you hold stuff in your head? Do you know this? How many pieces of, of information can you have in your brain, short-term memory, at a time? Do you know this? Seven? Seven pieces. So I was aghast when I went to an ER, and the communication system that they had was when a call came to a doctor, the, the, the desk yelled out, pick 5643. I'm like, well, you only got two things left to put in your head. Pick 5643. Can you remember the patient's name and age? But then you're not going to remember what you wanted to say on anyway in the call. And, and yet our systems where we work are fraught with this type of design. That's a really bad design, right? And you know what the solution was? It was so easy. It was dumb. They just came in and programmed those lines. So now it was Dr. Welch, call 1-2. Dr. Welch, call on line 3. You know, just a simple thing to remember to go, not pick, so there's a task, and four numbers, and then you get on with it. So there's an interesting study that looked at, and I think thought this was fabulous and very relevant. So the EMTs give report to the staff in an ER, and then they saw how much could people remember five minutes later, and there's your data, about 50% of what was told to them. So the idea of communicating in the head may not be such a good one if we, if we just can't keep it there, especially with the amount of information we're processing. Five minutes, you're going to remember about half of it. Another thing, not to harp on this whole noise thing, but noise in the OR was associated with level 77 decibels. That's us every day, my friends. That's your ER right now back at home. That was associated with the anesthetist having trouble memorying, or remembering and keeping things in his head pursuant to a case. This is perfectly relevant to us in the ER. We're always at that noise level, and it's going to impede our ability to remember and process information. All right, so three big modes of communication are afoot in the ER right now, in the world, but we're focusing on the ER. First, verbal, which I, I really like it. It's fast, it's efficient. I like it when it's person to person because 85% of communication is nonverbal. Look at, the, look at the guy's face, and you could clearly see that in that slide, right? And haven't you had it? Like, so I say to Jill, Jill, I'm, you know, I'm going to give him another dose of pain medicine. I'm getting him out of here. And Jill does this. What's she telling me? Right? So I'm like, Jill, you don't like that plan. Tell, you know, what do you, tell, let's talk about this, right? If we'd been just communicating by a phone or a pager or radio, I don't get this. And I might need to get that because I, I don't know I'm not going to get that patient home as I have plans, my high hopes. Then written, and written has a role for us, especially with all the numeric information. Remember I told you, you can't keep that stuff in your head. And so having it in a written record is a really good idea. And so much of our communication will by default need to be this because we simply can't remember a Chem 4800, you know. Um, and then you also have this, and people who have been in practice for more than 20 years will know all kinds of creative ways that we used to communicate to one another, something that needed to happen to a patient, information being back. My first ER, all of our ERs ran the same way. Everything had a color strip of plastic attached to the chart. Green was go, I still remember to this day. Green was go, red means they want me to look at it really quick. White was there some information back that's just a routine, and we had, it was just a flagging system. So how many of you remember the charts that you could pull the flag to communicate, right? Uh, so visual signal is very real, and we could make use of it. Now, if you've lived through that era where you used lights over a room, where you used flags on a wall, you used flags on a chart, you moved a chart to a different rack, if you've seen that, what have you noticed now that everything's electronic and the queuing is on a computer screen that is Lilliputian? What have you noticed? A lot of people have commented as they've gotten you know, ED tracking systems that are used as communication boards. It's a much more subtle communication, isn't it? It's a tiny little icon on a computer tracking screen as opposed to before, it was a flag, it was a chart handed to you and so forth. So in my view, I think visual signals cheap. I think there should still be a place for this form of communication in your ER. Oh, by the way, do you know Intermountain grew its own homegrown tracking system? And because critical labs were not getting noticed, they put a little black bug. So you walk by, and, and literally it's become part of our jog, and you walk by and like, Jill, what's the black bug in room two? What the heck is the black bug? Oh, really? The potassium is 1.9? Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, and so we've gotten, we've actually been trained to those little black bugs. Why? They tried blink blinking lights, colored lights, arrows, you know, you name it, and could not get the attention of providers walking by in a busy ER that might have 40 people in it at a time or more. 
and so the black bug, it's very noxious. They, had psych they did psychometric testing to find something that would really bother people, and they got the black bug. Uh, okay, so this is looking at your modes, verbal, written, visual signal, and thinking about it in a different way. Do you want the communication to go one-to-one? -one? Do you want it to go to one-to-many? One Okay, because there is information that you would like to go one-to-one, -one, and that's where you start thinking about things like uh, dedicated cell phones. And then there are other things, like the guy quit breathing in room two, that maybe you want everyone to know. We got a code blue in room two. Uh, and so, but I want you to think about this, because you, how have most communication systems evolved in ERs? How have they evolved? Not with much planning, would you say? Oh, we got Motorola radios? Great. Where did we get those? And, it's, and they've just sort of evolved that way without much thought. All right, so mediums are channels or systems of communication, and we've organized them as technology-based or not. And lots of factors might you know, influence which ones you choose. So technology-independent would be overhead paging, queuing on a whiteboard, physically using flags and so forth. Technology-driven are all the different machines that we have at our disposal to help communicate with one another. And you can imagine how you, would, how you could pick what you're going to use and identify when you work to use it. Do you, does anybody have a scheme now in their ER? Does anybody? Like we all know, if it's emergence information and we're defining it as this, that we will always use this mode. See, I think, I think we've just grown up sort of willy-nilly about it. We went from these small little ERs where you could just go and tap Jill on the shoulder and talk to her, to now ERs that are seeing 300, 400 a day, and we're, we've sort of by hook and by crook tried to be, keep our communications working. So technology independent. Um, I, still, uh, I, th I still like these, and I have to say, I still think there should be a place for these low-tech uh, and remember, those are the old things I was talking about, the flags. We actually, what happened was, did you remember if you actually used these, by about a month, the flags were missing, right? And they were torn. So, so that's why we literally bought plastic sheets, you know, uh, binder dividers, and cut them in strips. They were set in a, a, a little canister like a bouquet. And, oh, I want a red one. Jill, can you give me a green one? P put that bad boy on the chart, and everybody can see from across the room that that green flag chart can go home. I still get kind of palpitations when I see green and red flags, you know, because <laughs> I was conditioned to them for 15 years as a young doctor. Uh, okay, and then we also have a lot of technology at our, at our uh, hands. I'll talk about some of the common ones and what, what we know about their use and who likes them, who doesn't like them, and so forth. Um, as I say, I believe that we should use, we should carefully think what needs to go to one person, especially in the age of protected health information, and what needs to go out in mass to the department. I, I, th I say, I believe in the ERs that I've been in, I see errors made on the side of too much overhead paging. What, what's your experience? I mean, does, we need an EKG in room two, does that really need to be an overhead page? And again, I, what I feel like happens is you stop hearing that stuff. You know, uh, I have seen one ER that was overhead paging like anything that had to happen. What happened? Nothing happened because no one listened to them anymore. So I think it's a, that's kind of a bad plan. Uh, well, okay, so what are some of the, the factors that will influence your medium selection? Well, to be sure how big you are and what your layout is. Okay, face-to-face -face verbal communication works just fine in a little ER that's laid out just right, okay? Uh, I worked in probably the worst ER that I can say that I've worked at, I won't name the hospital, but it had 75 beds and it was set up like a hotel. You could not see one sick patient from any of the workstations. You would frequently have when somebody go bad, the a caregiver yelling in the hallway to try to get some help. Uh, and the people were running all over every hall. They, didn't, they tried to uh, run it without geographic zones. And so imagine an ER with 75 beds in it. People, and so what happened? If, if you don't have a good census and convenience to talk to people, then you don't talk to people, and that's a bad thing. So instead of getting three warnings, you know, Dr. Welch, room three is getting short of breath again. Dr. Welch, I think this one needs another breathing treatment. I don't get any of that. I get, Dr. Welch, room three is coding, right? And so we want communication. We want it to be easy. I love fly-by communication. I love, I'm walking up to them, hey, Judy, how's that little boy doing? Oh, is he feeling better? Great. Hey, Cindy, how's that kidney stone? Is he looking good? 
I love that kind of communication. That's important. I know it's casual, but that's the kind of information that we keep updated about our patients. And then I would suggest to you, I think that physicians and nurses have different needs for their communication, and so what appeals to one might appeal to another, not appeal to another. Here's what I see. Under 20,000, that's the beautiful spot. It's easy to perform well. It's easy to be a good and effective doc. You almost always are, have plenty of beds, and verbal communication works well. If you do multiple geographic zones or pods, you can keep that because you're effectively running a big ER like several small ERs in terms of communication. What I see is usually the next thing that's happened is people will go to, of course, you have to do some written on your board or your tracking system because you simply can't find the person to communicate to. But now you might go to radio or you might add visual signal. As you get up by 40 to 60, it's starting to get really, really noisy. And so you start to look at needing a hierarchy. And that's when I'll start to see voceras and dedicated cell phones coming in. For sure, by 66,000, you're going to do that. And you can imagine how nice to text and have a system say, OK, you don't have to stop what you're doing now. But I, when you come out of the room, doctor, I want you to check on this. And so you would text me that. Uh, and you could set up your, your hierarchy. If you call me, you really want me bad, and I always answer my phone. You could, you could make, craft your rules according to the resources and the size of your ER. As I said, this, this convenience threshold is very big, and what I want is I want somehow to create the convenience if it's not already there so that my nurses keep me up on what's going on a patient. I don't want to know that they're arrested when they arrest. I want to have had several chances to intervene before. Now, so nurse communication, I know this isn't 100%, but by and large, it's going to be local within the hospital, unit to unit, okay? And you may not need to divulge a lot of protected information. Conversely, physician communication is also often with consultants that are outside the building. You're often going to go name, age, diagnosis, a lot of protected information in that communication. Uh, it's often lengthy and detailed, although calling report is very detailed for nurses. And uh, is that anybody run the journey of faxing reports and going back away from it? I mean, it's hugely efficient, but what's bad about that is there's no room for interaction when you fax a report, right? The nurse on the floor does not get to ask any questions, and we know that's a critical part, part of handoffs and communication. So this is why you're finding nurses, there's actually studies that show this. Nurses are loving vocera. How many nurses have vocera? Any of the voice necklace radios? Do you like them? It's very efficient. It works well for a lot of nurses. Doctors hate it. And there's studies to back this up. Uh, and if you want, let me know. And as soon as we get our PDF copy, Dix and I will send you a copy of our paper. We're very cheeky to offer that, I know. But we'll offer you the paper if you want to actually see some of the resources behind it. So in any case, very, very different in what we like in terms of our communication. All right, affordances. So an affordance is the properties of the thing. And we can apply the term affordances to the different types of communication that we have in the ER. This is one type of affordance, co-temporality. It's like, are we there at the same time? Can we receive and uh, give the information at the same time? And simultaneity, like did anyone ever think of this? When you text, it's a one-way communication. That at the same time or immediately thereafter, the text doesn't come back saying the person even got it, right? How many of you text your kids because they won't answer the phone? I don't know what I pay Verizon for, but they won't have a, you text and you don't know what the heck because you don't hear anything. So. Uh, that's, that's some of the problems with some of these communications, even being able to know whether someone got your, got your information. All right, so affordances in the ED, we care about these elements when we're communicating. Urgency, right? Like, does, does someone need to know this now because we need to assemble a team? Privacy and confidentiality is an issue. Target, and again, is it one person needs this or do a lot of people need it? Length, right? You, there's some things that you're just not going to communicate by a text, right? Too long. Too long. Actually, as I get better at it, maybe I will be able to do this someday, but for now, can't do really long texts. And then, do we need to interact back and forth? And so this little uh, uh, paper, and if it, this isn't coming across well in your handout, let me know and I'll just flash you this as a nice little chart. It looks really pretty in color. Uh, and you can look at these different affordances and then different communication strategies and which ones are better for it. Uh, and you know, you can use this to sort of inform yourself about what would make sense in your ER. You know, face-to-face -face has some very, you know, great uh, affordances in terms of communication. But sometimes visual signal is just a thing because you want to go do something else and you can leave that communication and run off and do something else. So I always believe that when you make changes in your ER, you should do it with an idea 
you know, is it getting better? Does it make things better? How would you know if it got better? You changed some things, you, you implemented a new communication strategy. You can actually measure it, uh, you can monitor steps, you can look at sub-cycle times and processes, and you can audit communication failure. So there's a few ways, and staff satisfaction, I believe that's legitimate. Anybody using staff satisfaction surveys, you make a change and you're wondering how it went, our complex system may not show you dramatic improvements in any numbers, but I feel like if my staff says, you know, this is so much better, Dr. Welch, that's a win for me. That's a win. We've changed the communication system. So two-pronged approach to improving communication in the ER. First, reducing ambient noise, and second, designing a communication scheme. So some things that you can do, you can put a noise meter in your ER and start monitoring what's noisy, and that's how we know that a tube system is so noisy. You can get those sound absorbing elements in your design. You might just say no to automatic paper towel and soap dispensers. When you're in the airport, try the automatic soap dispenser. Look how noisy those things are, and think about them all over your ER. I would, I, when I'm in charge of the world, I'm just saying no to those, by the way, for the ER. Uh, also, decentralizing nursing stations and moving so that there's not a noisy little cadre of people in one station and moving them out. This has become part of new healthcare design. We'll have to see if that could apply to us in the ER. And limiting radio use. How many of you have radios? Anybody using radios in the ER? Where they're just a general, yeah, they're very, they can be very, very noisy. All right. This is called the Yacker Tracker. Teachers developed it, and it's a device that T tells them when their classroom's getting noisy, you can use it too. And some hospitals are using it on units, and when it gets too high, the lights come on first yellow, then green, and everybody tries to tone down the noise. Because remember, what's our habit in the ER? Just talk louder. Somebody will hear you. Just keep talking louder. Uh, so in any case, uh, and then like I say, I'm a big believer in, in identifying, like pad those garbage can lids. Uh, maybe think twice, especially at night, as pa if you've got patients that are starting to go to sleep, the portable x-ray machine, very noisy. Maybe just rethink wh where your noise comes from. And then designing a scheme, because I believe no one's doing this yet. And what you would do is you would look at all of the different elements that you use to communicate and come up with a strategy for how you would use them. Um, in particular, the quieter ones ought to have more of a role, like texting, using tracking center communications, maybe the bug is for you, you know? Dedicated cell phones I really like because you really can hone in on who needs to get the information and definitely limit overhead paging and radio usage. And you can look at and identify, okay, what are we gonna consider emergent communications? What are we gonna put in the urgent bucket? And literally decide what you would use for each level and train your staff. It would really, you, this is a project you could turn around in a month and you would reap tremendous value, uh, value from it. So here's an example, emergent overhead paging. I feel like somebody's crash burning, trying to die. Okay, I'll give you the overhead page. But urgent, there's lots of other ways that you could do this, including phone calls, text, even a beeper to the person. And you can see how you've sort of uh, got a little hierarchy. Let me quick end with this story from the University of Kentucky. I've written about this ER because I think it's just so great and they've done some very cool things. When they built their new ER, which has a lot of very innovative uh, design elements, they told the staff, um, we don't have an overhead page. We didn't get the overhead paging in. We're, we're waiting for it. It was a, a, a total fallacy. They really had it. But they wanted to get the staff to develop another way to communicate. And so they did a strategy. They said they did the hierarchy, what fell into which category, and came up, you know, we're going to text for this, we're going to call for that, and they came up with their system. Oh, by the way, this is a, an ER where they often have 50 people working at once. That's just the workers. And they have 240 computers in that ER. It's very computer driven. Dr. Humphreys, who's their director, then let them have overhead paging back. And he said in nine months, they only had two overhead pages. They just, they'd gotten their communications better. They didn't need to do it. And, when, and uh, they used other mechanisms. So I thought that was a win. And he claims that it is such a more calm place to work because it's not so noisy all the time. You can actually have conversations with people. So shh. <laughs> Any questions or comments? I mean, anybody inspired to do this? I think, to me, especially like where I'm supposed to have one hearing aid in, I'm inspired to think of I couldn't change my home turf to make it work better and have a better communication system. Yeah. Yeah. He said there's been examples of people using. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I didn't hear classic per se. I heard acoustic guitar in that one study that I was mentioning. Just the, you're the idea of kind of trying to create a white noise. Uh, to have it be a little bit more soothing. I still think overall we could quiet it down. You know, I really do. 
Uh, any, any other thoughts or comments? And maybe a hint at a recent frustration. There's a trade-off here between ease of access and being interrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it may be a sign of getting older or administrative duties, but I, I find the interruptions when working clinically to be um, disruptive, frustrating, and, and at some point dangerous. Mm -hmm. Where's the trade-off here? I suspect that's what was behind the vocero results, uh -huh. that docs got tired of getting interrupted for every They absolutely do not like low, the low radio level. when they're talking to patients and other providers. Is, is there a sweet spot? Is there any So that's why solution? I like systems that recognize the differences. Give the nurses the voceros if they like them, you know? But if they want me, they'll have speed dial and send me a message, either text or directly to my phone. So you see what I'm saying? You can craft it different different strategies. In fact, Christiana, I think, does vocera for nurses and phones for docs. Is that right? Anybody here from Christiana? If I have it wrong, I'm not making it up. I just got the wrong name of the institution. But there are places that are clearly doing that. And I want to save you from those interruptions, too, because they make you make mistakes. And don't, especially, anybody noticed with the influx, you, like you get some new nurses in your ER, and they do need a lot of you know, double checks. They're nervous about things. So I, I'm getting things like, Dr. Welch, so room three is ready to go? I'm like, I queued it on the tracking system. I put it in the rack, and the discharge papers are there. Yeah, the patient can go. But they want to double check. I think that interruption is unnecessary and dangerous. And so I want to keep that from you so that you can, you, you know how to get your lab information. You know how to get information that needs to come back to you that's, you know, not urgent or emergent. And I want to protect you from that other stuff because, as you know, interruptions make you make mistakes. They're very dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's saying they get a lot of non-urgent. Anybody ever get normal lab values? Someone interrupts you to give you a normal lab value? Uh, and you're very busy and, you know, already trying to process a lot of information. Yeah, so couldn't you see how you could take this project, you get a task force together, you strategy, have a little, uh, you know, strategy for how you're going to rank your communications and which method you're going to use, which mode, how they'll communicate to you, and then through the training process, they'll sort of get it. I mean, we, you can even present them with information on how dangerous interruptions are and sort of get your, your uh, sort of change the culture on, on board in your department. I think it's entirely doable. You can push a queue on a tracking board. You can, I mean, I've seen from the oldest non-tech systems where the paper with the results is printed on the chart and set on the doctor's desk. I saw that in the hospital. They just pushed it to the doctor, so it's right there for you when you get back to your desk. Or, or you can communicate with a queue on a tracking system and the bug if it's dangerous. You know. All right, I'll take more questions in the back because I don't want to get us off our schedule.